In this episode, we sit down with Jason Liu, the co-creator of Instructor. We discuss the impact of function calling in language models. When OpenAI introduced function calling, what they said was, we now have a fine-tuned model that is built for these kinds of tasks. We're not begging the language model to give us JSON and hoping that the enums are matching out or the keys are, are spelled correctly. The state of AI agents. Yeah, I think what people have been moving towards these days are more like workflows rather than autonomous agents, where you can yeah. trigger a workflow that has a plan and some components of that plan are using language models. And the possibility of making major discoveries in AI today. This field is so new that you can do things like discover Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law is a law that we discovered like hundreds of years ago that just says that the harder you pull a spring, the longer it gets, right? These are things that feel obvious now, but just by being first, you can really uncover some of the interesting patterns around these behaviors. Let's get started. Give us like a one-liner for instructor. Yeah, I think a lot of the work that we do with language models aren't really building chatbots. They're integrating existing systems with existing systems. And they don't really communicate with natural language. They communicate with things like APIs, schemas, and JSON. And so an instructor is a way of making these language models more backwards compatible with the APIs we're familiar with using. Right? That's kind of the idea of function calling and being able to call functions or make a post request. Instructor makes that very easy and introduces different ways of prompting language models. Yeah, and so I, I think for me, this was like, I started looking into this kind of structured extraction stuff in April, like when GPT-4 came out, this was pre-function calling. So, you know, you're trying to get GPT-4 to give you back like proper JSON responses and doing all this hacky mm-hmm. stuff and like sending the JSON back. And then when function calling came out, I think that's kind of when this got interesting. Why do you think, I think that this is going to be incredibly impactful long-term, this ability to add structure to like semi and unstructured data. Like what, what are your thoughts there? What, why is this such a leap forward? What does it enable that, uh, maybe wasn't possible before we could do this? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the improvements in language models have basically been around like RLHF and fine tuning. And when OpenAI introduced function calling, what they said was we now have a fine tuned model that is built for these kinds of tasks. We're not sort of begging the language model to give us JSON and hoping that the enums are matching out or the uh, <laughs> keys are, are spelled correctly, right? Sometimes you'll ask for a key that's first name and sometimes a snake case. And sometimes it's, you know, capital F and capital N. And, and these, all these things are things you have to really defensive code to protect against. But now it's, they say, okay, you give us JSON schema, we'll give you the JSON back out. There's a lot more confidence in, in being able to ship these products. Whereas in the past, you might be getting JSON one day, but when they update the model, now, all of a sudden, you get parts and error that says the first, the first characters are, sure, here you go, here's the JSON. And all of a sudden, your JSON parsing breaks. Yeah, and, and so, uh, you know, I think function calling came out in May, I believe. And in my own experience, GPT-4 is, for the most part, the only model that can do these extractions reliably. So I think there's kind of two parts to it, right? There's um, actually getting back, like, the structure that you ask for, which we can now do, you know, 100% of the time. And then there's... The second part, which I think is really what instructor is focused on, which is like, how do you prompt the LLM properly and give it the data that it needs in order to actually give you back the structured data that you want, right? So a lot of the times, like, it'll mess up on if it's extracting a link or if it's it's extracting a name, it'll grab, you know, the wrong last name or something. Have you explored, uh, have you explored doing this without like with, with open source models, like looking like Llama or Minstrel or Mistral, or are you just like yeah. purely focused on the open AI? Yeah. I'm primarily only focused on using the open AI API calls because with my clients, we really found that it's fun to explore the open, the open language model space, but in terms of just improving productivity and lowering like maintenance costs of infant servers and, and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's just much more productive to stay with OpenAI, especially knowing that GPT-4 will ultimately be the models that you will use in production. I mm-hmm. found that really with this kind of extraction task, it, it also depends on the complexity of the extractor. If you have a one-page form with a first name, last name, and a phone number, you know, like Llama 7 billion can definitely do that. But some of the more complex things that we're building out with, for example, query expansion, where you do something that says, what was the latest news? Understanding these time ranges, understanding how to personalize that search query for your context, those are things that are very so difficult for small small language models. Sam asked earlier, and he asked, 
now that you can take basically any unstructured data and turn it into structured data, you have many potential things that you can do with this. I have a few ideas. But before we go into that specifically, I'm curious, because there are so many things that this enables, why did you decide to work on Instructor versus something else? I guess my question is, what fascinated you enough about this specific thing to work on it? I had this quote a while ago, which is this idea that this field is so new that you can do things like discover hooks. Hooks law is a law that we discovered like hundreds of years ago that just says that the harder you pull a spring, the longer it gets, it's, right? These are things that feel obvious now, but just by being first, you can really uncover some of the interesting patterns around these behaviors. And so for me, a lot of it was understanding how should we, how should we be prompting and how should we be programming with language models, right? We're building a lot of things like language chains and trying to figure out these new workflows to make language models a first class citizen in our programming languages. But really what I'm excited about is making them all backwards compatible. I want working with a language model to feel like just writing code the, reg the normal way, right? This is why I, I, like, I like using things like Pydantic and FastAVI. These are patterns we've developed for the past four, five, 10 years. And if we can work with language models with the same kind of architecture and thinking that we had for the past 10 years, they become a lot less magical and that actually will improve my productivity. Whereas if I think in a world where everything is a new prompting framework or, you know, constitutional AI is just validation, you kind of, you add more mysticism and it, it doesn't allow us to sort of use the pattern we've already discovered. So in a sense, it's kind of like compounding on work that's already been done versus focusing on something that's kind of new, feels kind of cool, but ultimately is less useful. Yeah. And I think it's, it's less useful only in the sense that it, it brings you to a new domain and then then you can become like the AI engineer. But really half of the work that I'm doing is like adding type hints, thinking about error messages, improving validations, and that's less sexy on Twitter. But in terms of actually helping the clients that I work with, these are the, the bigger improvements and the bigger lifestyle, improvements, quality of life improvements. You know, it's the data you extract should map directly to the database you want to write to. And the data you can extract should be structured logging so that your S3 tables are easily queried by ClickHouse. Like those are the things that we actually end up caring about a lot. And if we want something to not be mean, it should be a validation error and we should be able to trace those validation errors in Datadog. Those are the kind of things that we end up needing in a production system. And as you were working with these clients, can you talk a bit more about the broad themes that you're seeing with the people that you're working with and how they're using it? Yeah, a lot of it has been around I would say three applications. The first one is that there are a lot of systems where the backend underlying data is kind of hidden from you. So for example, in like medical records, right? They're like Epic has their medical record system, but each hospital or each patient will get a version of a PDF of that. And so there's a lot of companies right now that are just trying to manage the differences between the on paper version of the same backend data and being able to define extractions against that kind of standardizes the interface for consumers. That would be one big one, just like defining that data standard. The second thing that's really interesting is kind of like the streaming use cases, right? We found that streaming a chat model makes a lot of sense because now you can see the conversation come all at once versus waiting like 11 seconds on ChatGPT. But that also applies to streaming data, right? If I am asking for let's say, clothing recommendations. And the recommendation, there might be three or four different recommendations based on the context. I don't want to wait for all the recommendations to come at the, at the last token. So if I return a list of recommendations, I want to render each carousel as they come out rather than, you know, waiting for the last token. So it's almost like a dynamic UI application. And the last one is kind of like a query understanding, right? This is around the backward compatibility with existing search engines. A lot of people, when building these RAG applications, assume that when I ask something like a, in, in a sentence form, that I can just embed that and find the answer. But in the example I gave before, what was the recent news? What was the recent news doesn't really embed to anything that exists. Really, what you want is you want the search query news with a minimum published date, right? Maybe you want to find the word news for anything created before a certain date and converting back to structured data to be used by a search engine or an API, I think would be the 
kind of the popular like third third application that I'm finding companies do a lot of. And when you're working with these clients, uh, you know, I imagine you're using Instructor and a handful of other tools. But like you mentioned, you know, the tooling around these applications is not as sophisticated as it is for other types of software that you might build. What tools do you find yourself reaching for other than Instructor that are maybe new and AI specific? Yeah, funny enough, not that much. A lot of it has been connecting with existing infrastructure, right? A lot of it is. Yeah. The the only difference I say is because what OpenAI has allowed us to do is we can start with a product and a model first and then work backwards to create a better model. In the past, you have to start a company, get users, the users generate data. Once you have enough users and enough data, then you can train your model. So that's been inverted a little bit. So a lot of the work that we end up doing is is more around how do you collect the evaluation data? How do you get your logs in the right shape? So six months from now, you can train a better embedding model or you could train a better search model. All of those things end up being existing software. Even mm-hmm. in terms of observability, a lot of it has been using more old school systems like Datadog because it isn't just that I want to understand what the prompt is and the prompt out. Really, I want to understand what from the iOS app, what is the request being made? How is my Python application converting my query? When I send it to a database, how did long does the database take? And then when I summarize this answer, how does that sort of get me to the final solution? And, and observing that entire stack, again, is kind of just old school software engineering. Yeah, it seems like there are a lot of companies, or, or at least like six months ago, you know, the hot thing to do is like an LLM ops startup. And mm-hmm. I still haven't seen any products or companies that really move the needle all that much to the point where it's, I'm going to switch off of whatever else I'm using to like use this one tooling specific platform, right? It's I want something that is going to observe my whole pipeline. Like you said, like from the iOS app, the request that it makes all the way down to like my database and everything in between. Do you think there is space for, or, or I guess what kind of tools do you think do need to be built specifically for AI? I contrast that with a tool, maybe like Datadog, where they're just going to have LLM observability baked into Datadog, mm-hmm. uh, and they're going to sell that to their existing customers. Yeah, I think a big one will be cutting this evaluation data, maybe from production traffic. Right. So now as mm-hmm. the language model is being called, can we monitor that and then sort of do the evaluations of, is it mean? Is it, are you apologizing too much? Or even other things like, are the search queries good or bad based off of a relevancy score? Then you're going to have to have tools that can export this data in a way that you can fine tune a better model, right? And it's not just a language model. If you have a RAG system, maybe in your traits, you have the query, the query understanding. You then pull up the 10 documents you think are relevant, and then you get the answer. Well, when someone tells you the answer isn't good, what is the system you want to improve? How do you identify that? It, the, the answer could be bad because the chunks were pulled incorrectly or the language model couldn't interpret the nuance of the text data that, come, that came in to give you a good answer, right? And so there's, there's very few tools that can help you evaluate whether or not the retrieved data get, got you a good answer. If we had tools like that that could do this end-to-end pipeline, then you can just say, you know what? Now I can evaluate how good my search is, how good my retrieval is, how good my re-ranking is, and how good my answer synthesis is. Those systems are really hard to build, and I think many people are decided to build that in-house. But I think that's definitely something that is definitely needed. Especially as, you know, we use Datadog because a lot of the companies we're working with already have existing infrastructure. Whereas right. if you're like a startup with three people, it's actually a big pain to set up observability and set up open telemetry. And this is where a lot of the startups can can come in. I think the risk is once you grow to a certain size, you ultimately want a a solution that covers everything rather than just your post request to open AI. And how different do you think these are from company's company? So with a startup, do you think the needs are pretty similar? And as they grow, do you think those needs will change where people will need a custom solution built in-house? Yeah, I think ultimately, like very few systems are, are kind of built as a monolith, right? And as you get these microservices and distributed systems, you end up just building distributed of like distributed like open telemetry or, or sorry, needing distributed open telemetry type products. Um, I think it's definitely scary to build a product that you know people will graduate out of, but then it just become 
observability. You just have to build a better data dog. How do you think about these opportunities for like new startups that are building tooling in this place versus an incumbent that just adds AI into their existing products? I think a lot of it is going to be the velocity, right? Like you're like, if you are a company that's going to help companies build agents that work, they have a, they have a burning need because a lot of these companies have agents that don't work. Right. So if you can solve right. that problem specifically and grow with them, I think that's the big opportunity where like Datadog will never really be the tool that will build these things out for you. Right. With we have a big product, you know, we have these like minimum contract sizes of a hundred thousand dollars a month. If you want like custom support, I think that's where you can really grow with the design partners and the clients that you're working with and really figure out how to, how to also leverage AI in that process. Right. Yeah. The most successful companies yeah. I'm working with are companies where half the code is already written by GPT-4 and they can stay lean yeah. and move fast and iterate quickly. I want to bring us back to something that you said a little earlier. So I asked you about what you've been seeing from the clients that you work with and you mentioned three things. One of them that was interesting that stood out to me was talking about streaming not just text but different types of data. For example, if you are doing a fashion app, just streaming a specific recommendation and then getting the next one and the next one. And this kind of gets into the territory of dynamic interfaces. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything interesting in this space? You can take this question any way that you like it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two ways of interpreting dynamic interfaces. One is like dynamically generating the UI, like products like Vercel, like C0 and Galileo. The thing that I find, I would say, more important these days is, is actually if you build a chat app, you still need to dynamically create interfaces to make safeguards against some of the behaviors, right? Like if I want to book a plane ticket for a family of five with a, with a chat bot, I don't really want to just call the Expedia API and come back with a booking confirmation, right? There's still going to be components where I want UI to be generated because there's still a lack of trust with the chat bot. I think that's will be a, a big thing really is not necessarily dynamically creating new UI, but having a library of modules that the language model can pull up. In the same way right now, we can call functions. Really, I want to have a chatbot that can like have pop-ups and modals and allow me to deterministically interact with my system, right? If I say, set an alarm for 6 p.m., I don't want it to say, I did it, and then realize in the back there, I never really actually made that API call. Instead, I just want to have a confirm button or some kind of UI that is shown to me to give, make, give me more faith in that some of the behaviors are actually happening. I was talking to Abe who founded Ultra, which is basically a new email client rebuilt using mm -hmm. AI. And one thing we were talking about is dynamic UIs and how it would be used in Ultra or an email client specifically. And one way that's a pretty simple solution, but well, a simple thing is, you know what, how you tag certain emails or put them in different folders based mm -hmm. on certain 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 rules, right? If this, then that. Even just the ability to, in natural language, be able to do that, and now it creates the new interface for that. Or you can tell it, like, I want to see my emails in this specific interface, but you give it, like, guardrails, kind of like notion blocks. Now you have a new way of showing data to the user based on what they actually want to see. And so exactly. I think there's a lot of fascinating or interesting behaviors that you can use here. But I do think you're right. I think there is, one, a need for guardrail because, like you mentioned, you don't want it to actually just go and book the thing using your credit card or say that it's booked the thing and not actually done it. So yeah, there's this interesting dynamic where you have ultimate creative freedom now, but you still have to understand, like, one, human psychology of how people want to interact with these systems that they totally don't understand. And then two, it's like, you don't want to give people too much freedom because then they like freeze up. Kind of with chatbots, if you drop someone into a chatbot and you don't give them suggestions mm -hmm. of what's, it's like, what am I going to do now? Whereas if you give them suggestions, 90% of the time they'll click one suggestion and then they'll get ideas of what they can do or what they can do with the system. So yeah, it's like a pretty fascinating space. Definitely agree. I think also, you know, if you can't build trust in any of the agent capabilities, it's, it's a product that will have high churn. If I ask it what's on my calendar every day and only it, it and it only tells me maybe, you know, four out of five times, I can't reliably even, you know, do my work. Right. And having some deterministic UIs or some guardrails will, will at least, you know, build 
get you a product that has lower churn, more trust. I think you can get to a future where that potentially could work without any kind of UI, where you do have faith that the, the flights are booked, right? But even Google has a, I'm feeling lucky button, but for the most part, people want to see the top 10 results and click the third one or the fifth one and not necessarily be defaulted to the first, first link on the page. So this gets into something else that I, I wanted to ask you about, which is kind of the state of agents and specifically talking about, I'm curious on your thoughts around like, how are agents doing generally uh, in terms of like reliability? I think that's sort of the big question right now is how reliable can we make these systems? I'm curious what you're seeing on the consulting side. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the big tell right now is that a lot of these agents are sort of, they're behind paywalls, right? If they're not behind paywalls, they're behind wait lists rather than pay. If they worked, but they were expensive, you might see something that's $99 a month that, you know, can do the things that it needs to do, but maybe has to call, you know, two, three, four, a hundred times. But I think because we're, they're behind these wait lists, a lot of it is the fact that a lot of these agents maybe have 60, 70, 80% success rate, right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done in how to understand memory, how to self-improve, even how to select the right tools and, and making sure that there's not too many tools that it overwhelms the prompt where the agent doesn't know what to do, but too few that you need to sort of be more creative with how you architect these systems. Um, ultimately, I think what people have been moving towards these days are more like workflows rather than autonomous agents where you can yeah. trigger a workflow that has a plan and some components of that plan are using language models. But there isn't necessarily a while loop that just runs until the answer was recovered, right? You've seen, you know, AutoGPT like in the first few weeks. So like on GitHub, they had, so they had examples where an agent would run for seven hours and it costs you like $10 to recommend a bicycle. Right? And, and it, what happened was like, <laughs> they had a JSON error and it just kept trying to parse that JSON over and over again without any kind of escape hatch. And so managing those failures, again, becomes just like a regular software engineering issue. Of, like, how do you design processes? Is failure built into that system, right? Yeah, that's kind of, that's sort of what I've converged on as well, like in my, in my own research is rather than something that's completely autonomous, you're really building kind of like standard software flows with, with maybe some AI parts and then adding constraints along the way and narrowing what the AI is actually responsible for doing. Yeah. And, and you can still build, I think you can still build really interesting, valuable applications there. I think that's like a huge space that we'll probably see some really massive, you know, web scraping companies, kind of data formatting companies, you know, all sorts of opportunities there. Yeah, oh. I think ultimately it's the fact that you need to build something that has like a good feet of strength that needs to do something well, and then you should be able to expand on that. I think, I think when I was in college, someone told me that the right definition of an MVP isn't a car with no engine. The, the MVP should be like a skateboard and it turns into a bike and the bike turns into a little motorcycle, motorcycle turns into a car. And I think when I've been trying to see some of these uh, agent companies, it, well, they want to promise so much. What you end up getting is a car with no wheels or a car with no engine that it can't really get anywhere. And, you know, it's not a product that you can actually get users with feedback and, and improve that model. Interesting thoughts experiment, right? So a lot of people start with the agent and then work backwards to try and make it do the thing. But I wonder if there's a different way to do this, where it's, you start with a workflow and you're like, okay, this is, these are the steps that I usually do. And if you imagine just like, yeah, the steps that you usually do and you're like, okay, now that I have LLMs and I can, what step in this allows me to do like 10x more? And one example mm -hmm. is like, when you mentioned you have a library of potential UIs that you can call and then deciding on the fly which one to actually pull up and render and show to the user. It's like, oh, now that you have this ability, so many more possibilities exist. And so if you take a standard flow and work backwards from that and be like, okay, now I can just add in an agent in one specific step to choose between these options. Now it becomes kind of cool. So one thing that I, one more thing I want to get your opinion on, Jason, before we skip totally to ideas is like the, the kind of the state of open AI and what kind of what you expect from them. Obviously, you're like, I mean, we all are kind of very embedded in this ecosystem now that they're creating. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you expect from them in the next 
three months. I think they've done a few things recently that surprised people. Like I wasn't really even thinking about like Dolly three or how that's going to play into like chat GPT. And now it's just like part of chat GPT. Right. So if I want to generate an mm-hmm. image, my default used to be like mid journey or something, but now I just use Dolly because it's just baked straight into the experience. Same thing. Like I've been playing with their GPT four vision thing like on my phone super fun take a pic- random picture or something and just ask questions about it what are what are the other things that you see going forward that would be that will have a ton of impact and that you think a company that's as smart as open ai is focused on or is like willing to spend energy on yeah i think you know right now the way that i see dolly 3 is kind of open ai trying to capture a little bit more of the mid-journey audience right if you think of what are the other really cool generative AI companies with a lot of users, the, the natural that comes to mind is character, right? And so, you know, custom prompts is basically one additional character that you can set in your GPT profile. Plugins is some kind of tool-based system. I would be really excited to see OpenAI move towards maybe a more extensible range of personality that you can maybe install, right? You can have custom characters and custom instructions, then maybe you can use your friend custom instructions to do something else. That's super exciting. And if you get to a place where you can do that and you can share different personalities, then things like voice controls become a lot more interesting. If OpenAI has a therapist bot, for example, and you can have voice, voice conversations with that, then you just get a lot more data in terms of the range of voice actors that you could, you could have, right? I don't know if OpenAI will train on the voices that come into your model, that come into them, but that's something that I think is very exciting and sort of building more incentives to build out their voice capabilities. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you think OpenAI will ultimately try to be a consumer company? Or do you think, you know, their like two or three year plan is like everyone have the ChatGPT subscription and is using it for you know, talking to a therapist or, you know, image, like image generation, I guess they have now. What do you think their yeah. long-term plan is? Because it seems like they're moving more towards like a consumer type of product. Yeah, I mean, I know that they're trying to hire a lot more enterprise type engineers to build out their, their go-to-market. But I also know that a lot of the go-to-market isn't necessarily on the consumer side, right? I think they're working with mm-hmm. like Bain, for example, whereas Character AI, I think is 100% consumer. I can imagine, you know, Anthropic trying to be more enterprise and open eyes play is really going to be, we will have the enterprise product and then we can build a good API layer that developers can use to then build their consumer products. All right. I think there was some news that like Sam Alton was talking to Johnny Ives around hardware. Like maybe they can build like a hardware mm-hmm. product. But I think, I think people know in general, even from YC, that most of the money is going to be enterprise. Yeah. One, one thought that I had around OpenAI's plugins is that, you know, at scale, that becomes maybe like the most interesting B2B SaaS app store that could ever exist. So if you think about OpenAI starting to work with all these enterprise customers and using AI to help transform their data into some sort of unified standard, and then they could essentially allow developers to build plugins on top of chat GPT that has some kind of limited access to that data that's all sort of standardized. Mm-hmm. So you could build, you know, the very best, I don't know, linked, you know, all your customer data is in chat GPT and somebody could go and build an app and you could install it and use it to query your customer like data or ask mm-hmm. questions or whatever. So yeah, I don't I don't know if they'll actually do it, but so actually I think plugins as it currently stands is like somewhat interesting but not super interesting and the reason is because of the chat interface if there is a way to create allow the people that have built these plugins to make them more developer make them more like developer tools for people to build on top of then you can have custom uis built on top of someone else's tool plus that has access to open ai's data that they don't publicly share through any of their apis and I think that is more interesting, kind of like an app store, but more tailored to developers or companies so they can build their own custom interfaces. Because I really struggle with the concept of chat as an interface for most things. I think it works in some yeah. things, 
But for most things, it doesn't really work. Do you think that's like a Gradio style thing where it's like a set of components, perhaps that developers have access to that they can insert into chats? Oh, interesting. I haven't thought about that, but that could, yeah, I think that could work. Or maybe it's, yeah, some standard components that can be reconstructed in the chat GPT interface. Maybe if that's the consumer play. Yeah. I know Jason had a few things. I think that's kind of the direction that Langchain is trying to go around. They, they recently came up with LangServe and Lang, like the hub platform where you can now install your these different agents. I think it's like if you can serve that backend, there is a huge population of front end developers that can just then just make your app really nice, consumer friendly, and you know, something that people want to use. But ultimately, when you're building a product, it's not really the AI that is the product. It's, you just got to build a good product in general. And then now it's just a lot easier. But I think things with Rank Server and the Hub, you can now probably just install a bunch of different capabilities. Like there's just going to be a bunch of different YouTube transcript summarization tools or like this gong transcript to action item uh, type, type tasks. And ultimately the best one will just win that, win that service. Interesting. Yeah. How do you think about defensibility for any of these products? Do you think like the best, the best product wins, the best distribution wins? Like if you were, if you were going to build like a GPT wrapper, how would you go about, or how do you think about growing it and protecting it? And yeah, it seems like, you know, every, every new capability that's unlocked, there's 10 companies that are all like reaching for the same value. Yeah. In terms of defensibility, the way I always think about it is, again, you know, we want to model these workflows after things that work really well. So who has those workflows? Those workflows are embedded in the heads of your domain experts. Right? And then how do you make a model work really well? So you need to be able to have the data that encapsulates the behaviors of those workflows. So I think the companies that are going to win are going to be the ones that have access to those domain experts and are able to sort of distill that data back whether that is experts using your product and then using the logs to fine tune a model or experts being part of the product that you offer and then distilling that information. I think my dream AI personal assistant company would be one where I just hire a bunch of really great Amex concierge type folks, make them serve, serve uh, user requests and just build a key logger. And what you do is you just do that for like a year and now you have data that definitely OpenAI doesn't have. They just have the data of when an email comes in with some crazy request to, you know, book a six month vacation and like, you know, do all these things. I could figure out how a human translate that into actions, model that. Right. And once you have that data, that data is the most. Once you have that expertise, that expertise solves the most. Right. Everyone can build a personal assistant company, but maybe you can't build the workforce that you need to generate this data. That's really interesting. Do you think that we will see companies or like, how, how do you think about generating proprietary data? There's, there's been a lot said recently around synthetic data, uh, synthetic training data. How do you think about building these data sets and where do you think LLMs can be used to, I don't know, make, get, getting this data even easier? Yeah, I guess the way I see LLMs is not that the, it makes the data collection process easier. It's that with these very large models, the amount of data you need is a lot smaller. So when I was at Stitch mm. Fix, you, you probably had, you know, spent like half a million dollars getting all the e-commerce data and so data on like, how do outfits work together? Where are the styles? Right. Because the vision models don't have an understanding of what is like a trendy fall thing, but language models do. And so rather than spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get data, you might be able to get away with spending $5,000 to get data. But now the important mm. thing is because these language models are so good at understanding the data coming in, the quality of that data is very important. Things don't average up as well as they used to. If you have a couple of bad examples, it's going to teach bad behavior to the language model. So, so although the volume of data increase has decreased, the quality and the bar for that quality has, has increased. With fine tuning, have you, like, how do you think about synthetic data and how much it matters in fine tuning going forward? Because a lot of people are exploring the space using synthetic data for different use cases. I'm curious if either A, you've used synthetic data yourself or seen other people use it in a pretty interesting way. Yeah. So I could talk a little, a little bit about this from the context of the vision work I've done in the past. 
Uh, we don't really think about it in terms of synthetic data. We think of it in terms of data augmentation, right? You usually want good data. And whether that's generated by an AI or generated by a human really depends on your, the context that you're working in. For most of the applications where I use synthetic data today, it's mostly because we don't have enough users to build a good data set. If I had 100,000 users that was creating, you know, millions of rows every month of logs, I probably wouldn't want to create synthetic data because I just have exactly the data that is on domain to my users, right? where maybe I want to build a retrieval system and I don't have the query that users might take. I might then try to hallucinate queries and questions in anticipation for getting users. But then you can imagine that human beings will ask stranger questions and the questions that a language model will provide. So at some point, really what you want to do is you want to make sure your training data is on distribution with your user behaviors. And synthetic data helps you get there. In the computer vision world, what that usually means is if I have a picture of a dog, right, what if I flip the, flip the image backwards? I still want to make sure that's like robust to that kind of noise. Let me rotate things between 30 and negative 30 degrees. Let me change the colors or zoom in in order to create more examples so that my, my data can be better on distribution with the data that I might be seeing in the wild. I think synthetic data kind of has a place there where if you don't have enough data, that's something you want to do. But you, know, you can imagine that a company like Facebook might not have to worry too much about synthetic data because they just have the news feed. That's a much better data source. And their question is going to be around what data do we throw away rather than what kind of data can we fake to improve our model? That's fascinating. I didn't think about it like that. But now that you say it, it makes a ton of sense. I'm curious, for the last couple of minutes that we have, are there any ideas that you had about interesting tools that could be created or companies that could be built? Yeah, there's one thing that I think is really interesting right now, which is that the people who build the tools for language, for language models are not the people who prompt the tool. So for example, say, say the Stripe API, right? Say someone builds a line chain integration with the Stripe API and then they say, oh, the Stripe API doesn't work, right? Is that because the Stripe developers did a bad job or is it was because the prompts in the PR was bad, right? Uh, Maybe if Stripe had to spend more time, the prompt would have been longer. Maybe each attribute would have been documented better. There might have been like two extra paragraphs on explaining why you would use this endpoint versus this endpoint and why V2 isn't compatible if your user, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this weird relationship with how the responsibility of the prompt. So who is responsible for producing the right prompt for a tool, right? That's almost like saying that when, when, you know, we have a Python integration for Stripe, a random developer is writing the Stripe documentation for Python rather than the Stripe developers having ownership of that. So I think there's going to be a lot of interesting ideas around controlling that ownership a little bit more. Right. And then to say now, you know, maybe these prompts only work for GPT 3.5 because that's what the developer worked on. But really, you might want to ship different prompts with GPT versus Anthropic or Llama 7 or 70 billion or Mistral. And managing that complexity, I think, is something that's going to be really useful, right? Whereas Stripe pays a lot of money to write really good human documentation, but they don't have that for the language model side. All right. But when you're, when you're installing binaries for, you know, any kind of tooling, they do things like check what kind of architecture you're on. They, they ask if you're on Linux or Windows or, you know, OS X 11 or 12 or 13, and they give you a different version based on that. You can imagine someone then giving a different version of a prompt that they maintain or even a different version of, you know, a fine-tuned model that they want you to use that have better execution, better control, control flow. So that's one idea I've been playing around with is like, who, who owns that data? Do, do people just ship Docker containers with LoRa's? Is it just text files that you pull as part of the documentation? Or should there be like stripe.com slash API slash V1 slash AI? And now that open API stack has just paragraphs and paragraphs of descriptions that are, are purpose built for the language model to use based off the version, right? So I think there's some ideas there. Interesting. How do you make that backwards compatibility a little more compelling for big businesses? Whereas, you know, maybe Expedia doesn't want to build the, build the natural language layer, but they want to provide a service that any agent work with Expedia, but you don't want to run into a problem where you know, there's some brand risk in using that API poorly. So you could see a world where 
something like Lang Hub, maybe like Stripe had like their official agent that posted on Lang Hub that you can dispatch tasks to and it will kind of figure out how to interact with Stripe. Or or you could potentially run that as part of your own infra. Yeah, but the idea is that like Stripe gets to Publishes. be responsible for yeah. having the good prompts, right? Because you know, we we know that like when you change from Anthropic to, to OpenAI, things break all the time because Anthropic wants XML. Right. We know that like, Mistral and Llama have different prompting patterns. And, you know, if you want to actually have good adoption, you might want to have coverage of the most popular APIs. Right. I think, I think that ownership is very, very loose. I think that's why instructor, you know, yeah. I try to write zero prompts for you. You have to write the entire prompt yourself because if you rely on me, then when something doesn't work, it's hard to figure out like, who's, who's responsible for that. Yeah. And I think something that I've seen in the wild, it, playing with uh, people's apps is, you know, you can, you can prompt a uh, GPT, but then they have some prompts that they prepend to everything that like, can vastly change the output of what you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, I think like transparency there is super important. And that, that is a really interesting thought is like, who owns those, who's responsible for it as time progresses, you know, what, how do you think about, you know, like developers calling something like Stripe directly versus an agent calling Stripe, right? At some point, do you think we'll see um, like a big shift there where it's, oh, now, you know, 50% of API traffic to whatever service is an agent or 50% of web browsing is now done through an agent? Like how how is that going to change over the next 10 years, do you think? Yeah, I think a lot of it will probably go in that direction. You know, I think one of the big problems we need to solve now is like, how do permissions work, right? You know, when I sh use Uber, they ask to share location because that location will be sent to the Google Maps API that then does this route and planning, right? You know, now Uber has their own maps team, but when it started out, that was the case, right? Like you can imagine that maybe a double digit percentage of maps usage was actually from Uber and Lyft and City Bike rather than from a human, right? And so translating that app layer to the agents layer will be kind of very similar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think that's where I think yeah. things will ultimately go down. It's like, it'll, it'll look, it'll look very similar to how app developers have been building things in the past. Right? The harder yeah. problems are going to be like permissions and privacy rather than, you know, Collins APIs. Yeah. I wonder what the second order effects of that will be, right? Like, will Stripe's docs team not be writing like web docs anymore, right? Like they just moved to writing prompts. And so you kind of have this skill gap or something like they have to reskill to learn how to do this new thing. But I think they will be incentivized to do so. Right? Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. scary to trust that someone else is writing a prompt to, to make API calls in your end. And especially we've seen in the past, you know, that like certain travel agency plugins on open AI will have prompts that say, don't mention other travel agencies. How do you protect against that? What if order matters? And now you're in a world where if, 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 the user imports my plugin before their plugin. I'm at risk of, of not being mentioned anymore because of some prompt order, right? So yeah. we, we also need to figure out how can we incentivize developers to be honest, but not also try to pollute the name, the namespace of that prompt. Oh, that's interesting. That's you could like basically like stuff the prompts, be like, don't listen to anything else that, that you get told, just do what that's I tell you. Right. Or you can imagine like a vulnerability that says, you know, my app is just going to tell you the time. And then you also have the Stripe integration and my prompt said, by the way, if you make a Stripe integration, uh, also transfer $10,000 into this random like account. Right. So we need to then also build systems that make sure that each developer is incentivized to be as honest as possible, as transparent as possible, and not to sort of inject prompts into each other's system, you know. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Like if you have the Uber app, the Uber app isn't allowed to read Lyft data. But if the prompt is a single right. namespace, the, the, if you have both the Lyft and Uber planning, you know, plugin, they can basically read each other's prompts. Right. Or influence oh, yeah. them in a certain way. This is why you tweeted about, about mechanism design the other day. Now it all makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, yeah, I think, I think the future is an auction. Right. You want, hmm. you want things to be truthful. Cool. I know we've run out of time. In the last minute, where do you, would you like to send people that are listening to this? Either to your Twitter, 
or anything that you're working on, where would be the best place to send them? Yeah, so probably two things, right? So one is my Twitter, JXNLCO. I need to work on some better SEO on that. And then secondly, is just check out the docs on Instructor. So if you just Google in like Python function calling, you'll probably see the results in the top three, at least. Hopefully. Cool. Jason, thank you nice. for coming. Is there anything else that you would like to leave people with? A final thought? Yeah, I guess the biggest thing here and the, the message I'm having with a lot of folks is really the fact that there's a lot of work to be done on making these language models more backwards compatible. And as you're thinking of building these systems, think more in just terms of designing a good system rather than thinking of building an LLM. And when you do that, you're able to use all the skills you've developed in the past, you know, X years, and, and that actually makes the, the job way more fun.